welcome all to the ISA National Academy program, the ISA online PG classes, which are held every Monday. And today, uh, I've got a mixed feelings, a feeling of nostalgia, happiness and joy on one side, and a feeling of fear and apprehension on the other side. Joy and nostalgia because my MBBS classmate, my MD colleague, Dr. Arun Sharma, who is now in Chandigarh, will be sharing his vision, thoughts on a very sensitive topic in which we all are apprehensive, the peri-procedural and peri-operative depth. So, I know it will be a very interactive session. Welcome, Dr. Arun and Dr. Arun Sharma. And uh, we have the session will be chaired by two eminent members of the ISA legal cell who have, who have got qualifications in the field of the medical legal as well as the legal matters, Dr. S.C. Parekh from Hyderabad and Dr. Shiv Kumar Kumbar from Hubli. So I hand it over to Dr. Monica Chikara, who is the coordinator for today's program, to carry it for Dr. Monica Chikara from PGIMS Rota. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. We are having our ISC PG online classes every Monday from 5 uh, p.m. onwards. And today we have Dr. Arun with us. Dr. Arun is, sir, uh, can you just allow me to share the screen? I'm not able. You can do it. It is allowed. Thank you, sir. Dr. Arun is a director of medical intensive care unit, Fortis Hospital, Mohali. And he has done his postgraduate diploma in medical law and ethics also from Bangalore. He's general secretary of ISCCM Chandigarh branch and coordinator of ISC legal cell. He's the coordinator of ISCCM legal awareness and action council. He's AHS certified BLS and ACLS instructor since 2007. He's a teacher for IDCCM and for DNB critical care and thesis co-guide for DNB internal medicine. He's a guest faculty in many conferences, several training, uh, he, uh, is a part of several training programs, critical care initiatives, and social campaigns. He has more, more than 18 publications in index journals and three chapters in book. He's a life member of ISA, YACTA, and ISCCM. His areas of special interest are transesophageal echocardiography, promoting and ensuring safe ICU care, improving communication skills, ensuring and promoting judicious documentation and record keeping, palliation and end of life care, and legal aspects of medicine. Welcome, sir. During this, the course of this uh, class, everyone will be muted. If you have any questions, you can just type it in the chat box and they'll be taken at the end of the class. Sir, if there are any questions, uh, Arun sir, if there are any questions or there, there are any MCQs, I'll uh, be reading it for you during the class. Over to you, Arun sir. You can please unmute yourself. So I have Thank you. I haven't seen any issues. I wish we could have uh, had an interactive session in the form of a physical meeting, but then this is a humble beginning. And uh, I wish uh, everyone a very good evening. And uh, it's a matter of honor and privilege for me to be doing my presentation on this platform. And uh, in front of eminent chairpersons, Dr. Shiva and Dr. Parekh. And uh, I extend my sincere appreciation to Indian Society of Anesthesia. Dr. Naveen Malhotra, who's a dear friend. And uh, I believe uh, all of us agree to the fact that kudos to his efforts, Indian Society of Anesthesia is at a completely different level now. He's given me a liberty to uh, talk for about 45 minutes. I have about 45 slides, which I've divided into three parts. And uh, I hope I'll be able to do justice to this uh, session. And thank you so much. I, I begin with my presentation now. Yeah, please, sir. go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I start with a very basic uh, case scenario. This is uh, uh, my colleagues who are from a, who have some legal background know that this is actually a real case, but then I've slightly modified it for the purpose of teaching. So uh, we discuss about a 26 year old male. He's an ASA one patient. He's admitted for septoplasty under monitored anesthesia care. He develops intraoperative cardiac arrest and subsequently uh, since the surgery was being done in a nursing home, he shifted to a 
postgraduate teaching hospital in an ambulance, and he's declared dead in a few hours after admission to the ICU. All these sequence of events, they happen between six hours. The surgery was taken up about 6.30 in the morning, and the patient is declared dead at about 2.30 in the evening. If I look at this situation, I would say uh, death in the operating theater or anywhere while undergoing a procedure is a nightmare for the anesthesiologist. In fact, it's a stressful event and it puts at stake the reputation of an anesthesiologist, which has been earned after so many years of clean, clear practice. When I decided to do this presentation, I talked to one of my surgical colleagues that would he be interested in uh, attending such a presentation? He simply was, he gave me a very simple answer. He says, deaths don't occur in the OT suit nowadays. Days. I don't think we need this presentation. But then I completely understand that anesthesia has become safe from the practice that pro we probably did about three days ago. When I did my, uh, when I did my post-graduation, I think we had limited access to uh, anesthesia workstations. We had uh, very few uh, pulse oximeters. ETCOT was something which I probably saw when I did my postgraduate registrarship at PJ Chandigarh. But yes, undoubtedly, anesthesia is one of the safest branches in the clinical practice today. And it will be thanks to the safer drug, better monitoring, and the better quality equipments that we have. But the complications still occur. As per the available uh, literature, the death in the OT, per se related to anesthesia would be rated at somewhere around 0.3 to 0.8 patients per 1 lakh anesthesia-related procedures. And death per se in the OT due to multiple other factors would be about 1 to 30 patients, again, per lakh uh, procedures. And most of these happen in the emergency surgeries. Nearly 80% of these deaths would occur during uh, the high-risk procedures. Well, while... The, G, hello. G, G. Projecting your slides. Hello. Not projecting your slides. Uh, it's not visible. Oh, you have not even started sharing. Just that's what I was wondering. Just. Oh. Oh. Is it visible now? Yeah, now it is visible. This is the first slide which is visible. So is this visible now? Yeah, this is visible. So this was the case scenario that I, I'm sorry, uh, this was the case scenario that I talked about. And uh, the, the risk of anesthesia that I was talking about, Bursi related to general anesthetic is somewhere around 0.3 to 0.8 per lakh anesthetics and intraoperative death otherwise is about one to 30 patients per lakh anesthetics. And most of these would happen in high risk surgeries. What has changed is with the anesthesia becoming safer, more and more safer, I think our sur dear surgical colleagues, they are taking more and more heroic procedures in the OTs. And this simply means that we as an anesthetist have to be prepared for all the eventualities that would happen during these procedures. On top of this, I think general public is still not aware about the intricacies of anesthesia. While they would, would accept some kind of limitations in the surgical procedure, they would want 100% from the, from the anesthetic and the anesthesia personals. While I was... Uh, Taking this, uh, preparing this presentation, I came across this uh, this uh, quote by Professor Etkinhead, which talks about the fact that the focus of training in anesthesia has always been concerned about avoidance of disasters, and rather than the management of aftermath. So while these complications are minimal, rare, remote, but then they can occur. The complications can occur, and we as an anesthetics, when you come across these complications. We are when if you are not prepared about these these disasters, we may not be prepared about it, and this we may land up into a soup. So the purpose of my presentation is to talk about the second part of it. Just in case this these these complications or death occurs in the OT, how should we manage the scenario? So let us though this is not the 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 reason we've uh, we've had this meeting. But yes, there could be several factors which can be responsible for a death of a patient in the operation theater or outside the operation theater, especially if, uh, if a person is in a monitored anesthesia care, let's say in a bronchoscopy suit or in an MRI suit or in an endoscopy suit. So these, these complications can occur anywhere. What we need to understand is uh, that for, for uh, uh, leagues suit with the legal aspect,
Doctor Arun, your voice is breaking. You are muted. Uh, Dr. Arun, you have to again start sharing your screen and you have to unmute yourself. Is this available now? Yes, sir. So I was talking about the fact that we have certain chapters in the Indian legal system. Uh, one of them is a criminal procedure code, which talks about how an investigation needs to be done in the case of an offense. And there is a section in this criminal procedure code, which is section 39, which says that it's, it's the duty of the public to give information about certain offenses to the authorities. And when it is applied to anesthesia personnel and in the OT environment, it is written that death on the operation table or death within 24 hours post-operative is considered as an unnatural death. And this is something which needs to be reported to police. The other scenarios which we need to be aware about are the related to a medical termination of pregnancy or a sterilization procedure, death after an accident, poisoning or a violence, or when there's an allegation of medical mismanagement. So in all these scenarios, it is expected as per the statutory guidelines that the hospital authorities need to inform police about it. How do we usually handle these situations? In most of the scenarios, we would actually try to stabilize the patient. And in case the patient cannot be resuscitated, patient is, the surgery is stopped, the procedure is abundant, and the patient is usually shifted either to an intensive care unit or in the post-operative area, where uh, while the attendants are kept updated about the situation, uh, the patient is declared in either in the post-operative area or in the ICU, and the body is handed over to the attendants as per the institutional protocols. But what is a textbook approach? What is recommended as per the legal, uh, as per the law, is that we need to inform the medical admin and the family. We need to inform the police. We need the family about the need for post-mortem examination. We need the security. We need to ensure our own safety. But this is something which is rarely followed. In fact, I recently had a visit from a friend who works as an anesthetist in US. And a simple question, I asked him a very simple question. What do you do if there's a death in the operation theater? He says, we, we never declare the patient in the operation theater. The patient is usually shifted to the ICU, which is something similar to we all do. But in the rare circumstance of a situation, if the situation gets escalated, we should be aware about what is the correct textbook approach. What are immediate concerns? While the anesthesiologist in the OT would be grappling with resuscitation, he also has a dilemma whether the patient needs to be declared in the OT or in the ICU. The next most important thing would be breaking bad news and handling the relatives. Equally important thing would be managing documentation, equipments, and the OT staff, offering post-mortem examination, a fear of a lurking fear of assault and mob violence, handling police inquiry, and a threat of FIR and arrest. And these are the situations that I would be discussing through my presentation. The late concerns would be a specter of litigations. The, the, the opposing party or the aggrieved party can go to the professional regulatory bodies like State Medical Council and the National Medical Council. They can file a case in the consumer court or a civil court for compensation. They can, in fact, also file a criminal suit, especially in the cases of loss of life. Let's look at all these situations one by one. As far as the patient is concerned, I think OT deaths, as we said, are rare, but but they do happen, they can happen. And the, the, the usual response is to abandon the procedure and the dilemma which we discussed about declaring the death in the OT post-operative area wherein ICU facilities are not available or shifting to the patient to the ICU if available. Well, as far as relatives are concerned, uh, we would expect shock, denial, anger from the relatives, especially if the patient was an ASA1 patient uh, without any comorbidities and where the recovery was expected to be immediate and it was also expected that patient would probably go home after the procedure. The most important vital thing which is needed in this scenario is to have a team approach. The, the common thing which usually happens is one tends to pass on the buck. Uh, the, the anesthesiologist may say that the surgeon was responsible or the surgeon would just try to uh, withdraw himself by saying that it was the anesthesiologist who was responsible for the unfortunate event. But what is most important and what is recommended is that we need to have a team approach. We should not start a blame game. The second important thing is 
when we we find out that the situation is getting out of control somebody a senior member from the team should go out, go out of the ot and provide the relatives with a brief update about how the situation has unfolded regular updates need to be provided the relatives would wish to know what has gone wrong why things have gone wrong ab kya hoga do not speculate tell them that as of now we are trying our best to stabilize the patient and we'll keep them updated as the situation unfolds uh, i did i was going through the literature and there was one paper which does talk about the fact that the ot personnel may not have an experience of talking to the relatives which uh, which an anesthesia colleague in the intensive care would have so the the literature does say talk about the fact that you could take help from a colleague in an intensive care unit this is among the most difficult part i would say and and uh, usually most of our conferences have an entire lecture dedicated to breaking bad news the american society of anesthesia uh, the acls course even has a module dedicated to breaking bad news the bad news should never be given in open corridor among the hustle and bustle of uh, the patients moving around it is recommended that the bad news should only be given in a in a calm closed environment uh one should uh, try to give them a clear update one should not use medical jargon uh if you apologize by saying to the family that i'm sorry about how the things have unfolded that's not an admission of blame it's nothing wrong about it you need to keep your mobile phone switched off give the patients their un your uninterrupted time uh as i said earlier we 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 could always find that the the families would be in a state of shock they would be in a state of denial they would be angry about how things have unfolded but you need to bear with their reactions you should allow the family to respond and acknowledge their responses you should tell them that this is the initial meeting and if they have another set of questions the team would be available to uh, to answer all those queries you should always summarize the plan for further discussion the family may wish to see the body of the patient and that needs to be arranged in the the most perfect way it be possible take help from a senior member from the administration we have a patient experience department in our hospital so when we come across this situation we always involve them involve the nursing supervisor these are the people who are who have not been there so they would be third persons but the the patient's family would be comfortable in their presence in fact i came across certain there are a significant amount of uh, uh, the uh, publications where they talk about the fact that simulation based works up on breaking bad news for the anesthesiology residents are something which we should involve or include in our curriculum well uh, we did talk about the usual things that we do and what is the textbook approach in this situation but uh, i understand if the the patient was a high profile case and you expect that you are expecting that the family would go to police a best case situation is to leave the things undisturbed leave the ampules undisturbed in the operation theater one should not fiddle around with the equipment there should be no loose talk in fact uh, the patient's family would be keen enough to get any information that ca they can have the information leak usually happens through either the paramedics person or from the support staff so one needs to ensure that the the things which are going on within the ot complex do not leak out outside of the ot complex we always say that the record keeping should be done contemporaneously when i use the term contemporaneous this means that the the recording should be done as the events unfold which may not be possible in a scenario where we are trying to resuscitate a patient uh uh an alternative is to uh, have a senior member of the team uh, doing the recording of the event as the events are unfolding the documentation has to be complete with complete documentation of how the event unfolded how did the anesthetic start what was the vital parameters uh, what were the drugs used uh, what were the vital parameters prior to the event was there any drug which was used at the time just before the event it is equally important that there should not be any discrepancy between the notes between the different teams so when i say different teams there should not be a discrepancy between the notes from the surgical team and the anesthesia team the most important thing which is always taken in an adverse thing from our from our legal system is one should never try to deliberately tamper with the records this is always a reality in the modern day uh, medical practice uh as soon as something wrong happens we could always see uh, mob gathering inside the hospital and outside the hospital so if this happens you should always 
<coughs> take up the photographs if possible, and these need to be submitted to the police. Uh, most hospitals have a CCTV footage, which again should be recorded and submitted to the to the to the law enforcement authorities. If there's a damage to the property, take a take a photograph. If your employees have been injured, it should be sent to a government sector, and MLC needs to be registered, and their injuries need to be recorded. Uh, we would always find the reporters uh, whenever you come across these situations. So uh, a senior designated member from the hospital should be the one who should be talking to the reporters, and he should be the person who should be knowing the facts. And again, the most important things, again, this, this senior member of the hospital should be clear that there should be no speculations. How do you handle police? If you're looking at a situation which may turn volatile, it is better that you inform the police by yourself. Always involve your senior admin and your legal advisor. If the police asks for the record, hand over the record after numbering, obtain a written acknowledgement from them for the same, and do not resist. I would say this is important. Do not resist. That is as this is interpreted as non-cooperation. Well, what happened in our case? The family was offered uh, in the, as the scenario folded. And after the death was declared, the family was offered to get the postmortem examination to ascertain the cause of death. However, they refused for the same and wished the body to be released at the earliest. What must the team do? I'll share these two examples with you uh, to try to explain about how uh, how uh, law interprets these situations in a recent uh, scenario which was uh, which was judged in 2019 this was a west bengal state consumer commission uh, in this scenario the a patient uh, expired in the hospital undergoing a procedure the the husband of the patient actually complained to the commission that uh, the hospital had actually forcefully released the body and that this reeked of conspiracy. The, the hospital, in fact, uh, put forward their statement where they, where they showed the documents that the husband of the deceased had actually requested that the body be released so that he could do cremation as per the rituals. And in fact, they had documented the same in their records. When the matter uh, reached and the police was asked to produce their document, it was seen that even the police diary had this documentation that the, the husband had actually requested the hospital that the postmortem should not be conducted. In fact, this documentation by the hospital and the documentation in the police diary uh, tilted the case in the favor of the hospital and the doctors. I would uh, talk to you about another case which was, uh, which was decided very recent in August 2022. Uh, this was a young patient, uh, a gynecologist herself, who had been detected with a, a some chromosomal abnormality in the in the uh, in the preterm uh, phase. And uh, as per the doctors, the the patient and their husband uh, requested that they would not be ready to uh, continue with the pregnancy since the patient was then was an asthmatic, and this was caused a lot of physical and mental trauma to her. What happened was unfortunate. The MTP was done but uh, she developed a retained placenta and while the patient was taken for the removal of placenta, she had an episode of severe bronchospasm and could not be resuscitated. The, the case went against the doctors for three reasons. The, the judge, the judiciary uh, documented that there was improper documentation of why an MTP was done at 26 weeks, which was a clear violation of the MTP Act. The judiciary also judged that this was an unnatural death and police was not informed and postmortem was not done. They were very clear that the denial of postmortem by the attendants is not an acceptable defense. And not doing an MLC, a postmortem in an MLC case creates more doubts about the case and the real happenings in the OT. So based on these four pointers, the hospital has been slapped with a compensation of about one crores. The case further unfolds. The relatives of the patients protested out the, outside the hospital. A local MLA was involved who pressurized the local SHA to register an FIR. An FIR was registered against the hospital under Section 304A and Section 34C. I would uh, talk about section these sections in the next two slides. So the next segment of my presentation is how should we handle an imminent threat of an FIR, police inquiry, and a threat of arrest? Let's, let's talk about very basics first. So how do the criminal proceedings start? The aggrieved party would go to the police and, and uh, to lodge an FIR. 
So the FIR would be lodged with the station officer. And if he refuses the same, the aggrieved party can actually go to a higher police officer who can then direct the local police station to register the complaint. If the FIR is not registered at the level of police station, the aggrieved party can actually go to the judicial magistrate. Then this is called as a private complaint. In the cases of loss of life, the FIR is usually registered under certain sections. We would all know about section 302, which finds punishment for murder. In cases of medical negligence, especially when, when there is a loss of life, the section that is usually invoked is section 304A, which, is, which defines death by rash and negligent act. And this is a section which is usually applied in the case of traffic violation, traffic accidents, anyone in scenarios like a bridge collapse. What we understand about is another two terms. <clears throat> One is cognizable offense, which is a person can be arrested without warrants. And second is bailable versus non-able. So bailable means that the person can be released and non-bailable offense would be something where once the, the, the FIR has been lodged, the person can be arrested and may not be released on bail. Once the FIR is registered, the procedure is set in motion and the police is expected to do investigations, record statements, seize equipments and arrest based upon the merits of the case. The police report is once the police report is prepared, they're expected to file a charge sheet and this, then the court, the case goes for trial and judgment. So this is how the scenario unfolds in the case if an FIR is lodged in the case of loss of life. Under normal circumstances, if an FIR is lodged under section 308, 304A, which is causing death of a person by causing rash and negligent act, the person, the uh, warrants may be issued, but, the, but this is a bailable offense. But what is usually done by the, the, the relatives is they would try to invoke certain sections where bail may not be granted. For example, in our case, the, the family had an additional clause, which is section 4034, which was invoked. Now, section 34 makes it non-bailable. I hope you would all remember what happened in the case of uh, in recently in Dasuwa, uh, Rajasthan, where uh, a patient had developed a postpartum hemorrhage and a case of uh, 304 was applied against the gynecologist. In fact, fearful of getting arrested, she committed suicide. I think it becomes important that we need to be aware about what needs to be done if such a scenario unfolds. In fact, the, for the next 10 slides, what I would be talking to you about the safeguards, the statutory safeguards, which have been provided to us doctors, especially to the doctors, if such a situation occurs. So let's look at the legal safeguards against a police action, which have been provided by our judiciary to the medical professions. And these, these statutory safeguards have been based upon these two judgments. And uh, one must be aware of both these, both these judgments, Dr. Suresh Gupta versus NCT Delhi. The first scenario was one where, uh, again, this was the scenario where a young patient had undergone a septoplasty and uh, unfortunately died uh, in the hospital. The second, uh, Dr. Jacob Matthews, was a scenario where a terminally ill patient had expired in the hospital. In both these scenarios, the families had actually lodged a criminal case against the doctors and the hospital. And these two cases, the decision in these two cases uh, happened over a year of over a, a decade, and the Supreme Court has given a significant amount of safeguards and privileges to the doctors. In the first case, which was Dr. Suresh Gupta, uh, the judiciary was very clear that where a death of a patient results merely from the error of judgment, no criminal liability should be attached to it. Only a high degree of morally brainworthy conduct and gross negligence would attract criminal liability. So at this point in time, we also need to differentiate. So a civil liability means compensation and a criminal liability means that person can be put behind the bars. So the judiciary is very clear. If the doctors need to be tried for criminal liability, the, the, the conduct has to be a very high degree of morally brainworthy conduct. And, and they've defined it as a gross lack of competence or inaction to the patient's safety. Let's look at some of the guidelines which have been given as per the Jacob Matthews case. The judiciary has been very clear that whenever medical professions are to be tried in the case of criminal negligence, they need to be treated with a difference. And the very basic that the judiciary gives is that the both the police officer and a judicial magistrate in the case of a private complaint, they do not have sufficient knowledge about the matters of the medical science. And it will be difficult for them to adjudge that whether a, a higher degree of crime was committed. 
and whether the doctor was actually negligent within the domains of a criminal law. So the judiciary talks about a very simple thing. It says that if an action is to be initiated against a medical professional in cases of criminal negligence, alleged criminal negligence, we should always seek an expert opinion. And what are the recommendations? If the case starts off with a police complaint, it is recommended in I would say recommended is not the right word. It is mandatory that the investigating officer must obtain an independent opinion from a competent medical person who's qualified with the same branch and who's expected to give impartial and unbiased opinion. Now, this is something which would be difficult in our scenario. So this simply means that the police cannot actually initiate the complaint before taking an opinion from a person who's qualified in the same branch. Who's, who's well qualified. So this means that we doctors would have sim simply a good amount of time to actually prepare the case and the police has restrictions in initiating the action. Similarly, if there is a private complaint, the guidelines are very simple and similar. It is expected that the complainant has to seek opinion from a qualified medical person in the same branch who can competitively give opinion whether the case, the merits of the case allow a case to be tried under criminal, criminal medical negligence. As far as the Jacob Matthews uh, decision was concerned, it was suggested, but then with, there have been certain other decisions where now it has become mandatory that the this expert opinion should be sought even in cases of private complaints. The biggest fear as a medical profession would be uh, if there is an FIR and the risk of arrest. So there's been a judgment, which is uh, Lalita Kumari versus government of UP. Uh, as far as this judgment is concerned, it says if there is any cognizable offense, if registration of an FIR is mandatory. But when, when dealing with the medical offenses, it is very clear that a preliminary, preliminary inquiry is required before the FIR gets registered. So this is, a, this is a huge defense which is available to us medical, profe medical professionals if we come across this situation. So let's look at a situation that NFIR does get registered. Please do not panic. Consult your liar, lawyer. Cooperate with them and do not share resistance. Do not show resistance. If the police asks for a statement, give statement, involve your senior admin or a legal person. Let them search the premises. Let them collect evidences. Always prepare a list that's been handed over and take an anticipatory bail. Again, with regards to the arresting of doctor, the judiciary, as per the Jacob Matthews judgment, is very clear that the doctor who's been accused of a rash and negligent act. Now, at this point, we know that. So there's been an FIR which has been registered under Section 304A may not be arrested in a routine manner. The judgment is very clear that the doctors with an alleged criminal negligence will not be arrested in a routine manner unless and until it is inevitable or the investigating officer feels that the doctors would not make himself available or would not cooperate. In all other scenarios, the arrest should be withheld. So it is very important that one must be aware about the Jacob Matthews judgment. It is very clear that till the time a law is passed, Jacob Matthews judgment is a law in itself. And anyone who's interfering with the above rights, which have been provided by the Jacob Matthews case, would be liable for the contempt of the court as per the Honorable Supreme Court of India. We all need to be very clear that there are certain very basic things. Every citizen of this country is bound to follow orders of Supreme Court. It is recommended that you should keep a copy of this judgment in your hospital. Do not hesitate to produce it before the police if they act illegally. Always approach a high rank officer and always involve your local professional bodies in case the situation arises. What are the other safeguards which have been provided in the Indian Penal Code? If there's a death, so what is important is every happens in the hospital or every death which happens in the Operation theater does not mean that the person would be liable for a criminal negligence. In fact, there are certain sections which have been provided in our Indian Penal Code. Let's say we look at section 92. There's a death of the person, but section says if the act was done in good faith for the benefit of person, even without the consent, the person is not liable. Let's look at section 88, which says an act which was not intended to cause death 
but was done with consent and good faith, again, the person would not be held liable. So there is there, there are safeguards by our law to the medical professionals. And in fact, when I attended one of the meetings, uh, there was a presenter who said that the, the kind of safeguards which have been provided to the doctors are not even provided to the parliamentarians. A parliamentarian, if an, if an affair under him, for him, against him, he'll be arrested in the next three days. It's mandatory that uh, a, a inquiry needs to be done, whether the merits of the case are such that the person can be tried under criminal negligence. And in a country like ours, it will be very difficult for a police person to look for a for an expert opinion within a few days. I think it will take months before he'll be able to submit his opinion itself. Coming on to the last part of my presentation, would all deaths on the table qualify as criminal negligence? What does the what does the law talk about it? So this was a case where the family had uh, lodged a complaint, uh, 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 a complaint with the consumer forum. In this case, uh, the patient was patient had bilateral uh, PUJ obstruction. He was operated on one kidney. The operation was successful, but when the when the patient was taken for second surgical intervention, uh, the 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 patient unfortunately had uh, an intraoperative death. Well. Uh, there are certain interesting findings that were uh, put forward by the judiciary in this case, and they uh, just a second. The the judiciary was very clear that in every case where the treatment is not successful or the patient dies during surgery, it cannot be automatically assumed that the medical professional was neg negligent. To indicate negligence, there should be enough material available on board or L or else appropriate evidence should be tendered. In another case, this was a case where a, a patient died after a renal transplant. And again, uh, the, the complaint was did not go in favor of the uh, aggrieved party. It was decided in the favor of the doctors. And uh, the, the judges were clear that the doctors are expected to take reasonable care, but no professional can assure that the patient would come home overcoming the crisis. Thus, every death of a patient cannot be considered to be medical negligence. Another case uh, where uh, the judiciary said that the death of the table is not sufficient to prove rash or negligent act against the accused. So what if finally a litigation is served? Do not panic. That's the first and foremost thing that we all need to do and do not just go walking around the hospital telling your colleagues that a case has been slapped on you. Uh, get in touch with your legal advisor. If you have an indemnity insurance, you should actually uh, pass them a copy of that uh, complaint so that they are aware that a case has been uh, put against you. Uh, make a copy of all the records. So if you have a physical file, all the uh, pages should be copied into uh, in the form of a digital format. One should try to uh, give reply paraphrase to the complaint that has been put forward. Uh, involve your lawyer, lawyer, but we need to understand that a lawyer may not be aware about the medical part of the things. You need to sit with him. Do not sign off any document that he gives you. Always read the documents that have been prepared and submitted uh, for the court. While we've discussed about the patient, about the about the operation theater personnel, we've talked about fire. What is most important is to take care of this person. It's a stressful situation. We did talk about it and uh, a situation where the, the reputation of the anesthesiologist that is, is at stake. So we need to support this person. If the event happened in the presence of a junior resident, a senior member of the team has to support the person. If this person requires to take a leave from his duties, duty, the leave should be given. Uh, I think the bottom line that I would say is the, the anesthesiologist in this scenario must be supported. Team briefing, debriefing is a concept which is catching up uh, in, in all platforms. And the aim of the team debriefing is not to find out why these things happen or to put blame on somebody. The aim of a debriefing is to, uh, I would say, reassure, console, uh, scrutinize the care which was provided per operatively. The team can honestly and humbly acknowledge errors. Uh, the debriefing is to be done as quickly as possible before the team disperses 
And this is something which I would strongly recommend whenever a stressful event happens in any of the any of the hospital areas, especially if it happens in the OT also. Coming back to the the second slide that I put forward, uh, the statement which was put forward by Dr. Professor Atkinhead. It is important that we teach our residents about uh, not only about safe anesthesia practice, but how to deal with the situation if 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 an unfortunate per operative death does occur in the operation theater on any other area. Uh, we need to involve uh, or include uh, something like uh, departmental guidelines on dealing with catastrophes. We need to have an anesthesia crisis resource management curriculum and we also need to have uh, simulations on death scenarios and what would be the most appropriate way of dealing with the situation, how to break bad news. And uh, I strongly believe that our, uh, our, our residents need to be trained on these aspects also. Uh, I have intentionally not covered up the, the, the crisis resource management part and uh, the simulation related scenarios. Um, I and this is my last slide. Thank you so much uh, for your patient listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Arun Sharma, uh, for uh, the nice presentation. And now I'll invite uh, Dr. S.C. Parekh, uh, who is a past vice president of ISA National and uh, president of ISA Family Benevolent Fund. To please come and moderate the discussions, and uh, I'll also invite uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar, who is a very very uh, senior anesthesiologist from Shiv Kumar from anesthesiologist from uh, Hubli, Darwad, and uh, he's also a medical legal expert with qualifications in the legal field, and is also on the medical board of uh, Indian Medical uh, Association. So uh, a quick word from Dr. Um, Parekh sir, and then uh, Dr. Shivkumar from Bhattis. And then I'll uh, allow all the participants, they can unmute themselves uh, and uh, express uh, their, uh, the, carry forward the discussions. And uh, I'll also request Dr. Venkat Giri, I am present by SM National, uh, to please pitch in also. So over to you, Dr. Parekh sir. There is an opportunity for now everybody to unmute themselves. Everybody can Am I audible? Am I audible? There is some disturbance in your audio, sir. Yes, yeah. Now, one thing is whenever we discuss these things, it is easily said and done because when real scenario occurs, it is really very difficult to handle. Yeah. We can talk about it. We can suggest so many things, but when it really happens, it's uh, really very difficult to handle the situation and face the relatives and the attendants. And it makes a lot of difference when pre-operative assessment is made. At that time, it is expected and discussed with the relatives with a totally different scenario. But if it totally unexpected and it comes there, then it is very difficult. So this is one thing we must always give some time to discuss with the relatives in the pre-operative assessment. That is very important. Unfortunately, more, many of us don't get that much time to spend with them. We are so busy with the theater or other things that we don't get to sit there with the attendant for about 10 minutes and discuss everything. If that could be done, I think the problem will be sorted out more than 90% in advance of this. Because I strictly, strongly believe that problem is not because of adverse outcome. Problem is because we have not prepared the people to accept that adverse outcome. So it is their mental makeup. If in advance they are told that these things can happen, and be prepared for that. Then that problem will not. But they are not mentally prepared and suddenly they come to know that the patient is no more there, then naturally the anger and other things happen. So that is one thing. Then uh, this 
political intervention we can hardly do anything because politicians are very strong fellow and they are influential on police also and maybe it's very difficult it is only theoretically we can say but uh, once uh, the politician is involved most of the time he is intended intention is that problem should not be solved so that he is always involved and he can manipulate the thing that is always there so he will try his best that the problem continues there is a lot of disturbance can you ask uh, hello so there is a lot of background noise uh, from the rain ha ah, background i am not able to listen to what is being told just just come forward sir just come no mobile so i think you can take more questions from audience yes sir no care sir what do you dr shivkumar um what do you say dr kumbar dr shivkumar kumbar please Monica, you can in the meantime take up the questions in the chat box, and yes, let's let's make it as interactive as possible. And uh, anybody can uh, unmute themselves uh, to uh, to express and interact with Dr. Arun Sharma. Uh, Dr. Arun, I uh, this question uh, actually arose in my arise in my mind also when we were discussing the slides that how does the pre-operative high risk consent safeguard the anesthetist if there is any death on table? so dr anita and dr mohammad sadik they both want to ask this question so uh, like you told that uh, this uh, the death on table uh, has to be informed to the police so if we have taken a risk to life consent or a high risk consent do we still have to do the same no sir your voice is uh, uh... not clear dr shiv kumar kumbar uh, i think you are in ot so that is why your voice is uh, slurring okay dr arun uh, we can take up take up that question dr monica i think what we need to understand is we need to keep two things different we cannot stop a person from lodging a, a case against the doctors the documentation would only help in preparing a strong case the major challenge is you've taken good consent but what we need to understand is that any death the as far as the first and second slide was concerned any death in the ot or any death within the 24 hour period is considered as an unnatural death so if there is an unnatural death as per the textbook we need to inform the police so we need to separate those two things what we do and what has happened So, Dr. Bhavna wants to ask another question. If I can take it, sir. Uh, so, can we take uh, ASA Grade One and Two patient for surgery, having his consent only, if no relative is present with him? <laughs> uh, one is this question would be unrelated to the presentation that we do today. Two, if you look at the Western world. the consent of the patient is the most important thing if the patient is competent adult then consent of his patient is good enough why do we take consent of the family i think the reason why we take consent from the family is they were they have, that they are yeah. been a witness no no give me they that these people also have been a witness to the entire discussion so yes the patient asa1 can be taken under surgery by the patient's consent only there's no doubt about it actually i just wanted to add something may, the may consent of the family is not even called consent it is called assent so the may. consent of the patient is the most important thing you are right sir may i say something sir please sir yeah the thing is even in asa 1 and 2 cases problems can come up so i don't advise that we take them for surgery without consent not only consent even the presence of the attendant because if something goes wrong whom do you inform if they are not there so we don't take any general anesthesia cases unless an attendant is there waiting outside and his 
consent is taken for one more reason which i tell you is that if the patient dies the problem will be created by the attendant because patient is no more so if attendant has signed that consent he will think twice because he is part of having signed it so he will think twice before creating any problem and even if he creates problem at least he cannot deny deny the consent that he has agreed and he was told about all these things so that is one practical reason why we must insist on everything that a attendant also signs the consent I, I agree with you, sir. I agree. Uh, coming to the FIR, uh, I had uh, one uh, this thing, uh, anesthetist, uh, maybe dentist, uh, who has uh, uh, registered a FIR. Then I challenged it in the High Court of uh, uh, Darwad, Karnataka, stating that unless there is an uh, expert opinion, how can they register a FIR? And the FIR has been squashed, sir. Okay. And many times what happens is, on table death may not be subjected to the uh, post mortem so if you know the cause of death if the relative satisfied so there is no need to make it a mlc and uh, if they don't accept your cause of death so the best thing is to inform the police and make it a mlc many times you know that they are going to be expected by the relatives but uh, some angle you know that probably they are troublesome okay are educated probably by looking at their uh, communication uh, how they behave intra Particularly post operative, when you try to communicate them. So, if you could spell it, even if they accept the cause of death, best is to inform the police, sir. So, these are the safeguards which I can uh, uh, definitely prevent the, some of the ongoing uh, catastrophes. Dr. Giri, uh, welcome. Thank you. It is not the content bystander is relating is the witness for this. It is signature and all. That is what is more important. So, yeah. Yeah, the relative signs and he agrees that, yes, he has signed, he identifies. Otherwise, who is identifying the nature and the patient? We should have somebody identifying in the court or wherever, identifying witness. That is that he is a witness that he has signed and tomorrow will tell. Even for that matter, I say in the theater or wherever it is, even an injection without a bystander or a relative, don't give an injection. It is not an unless it is an emergency. Because anything can go on. He can have a vasovagal attack or something. Who will give you that? Because the people will come and make issues and all because it is in India and especially in my state of Kerala, people will make that you have done that you have given the wrong incident. There should be somebody unless it is an emergency. Then emergency, yes, you can do it. Yeah, yeah. There should be somebody and it's not an hurry and all. That we should have to safeguard ourselves first. Then his thing. Yeah. Emergency, yes, it is done. That. So yeah, many, to... type, many times if there is a, a cardiac arrest and death on the table, you are about to declare it after all the research measures. The question arises whether you want to declare it on the table or, or, else, or else you want to shift it to the ICU and declare it. So it, again, it's a double-edged weapon and uh, many many times the relatives spell it. Something must have gone wrong in the voting, so he's trying to accept the things. So I think is the best thing is to be honest with the relatives and uh, tell them what exactly took place and how exactly you try to manage it. In the meantime, tell your assistant to uh, keep the records operated because police people uh, will not give you much time when the panchanama take place. They will not give you much time. Probably they will try to take a zero copies of it. The best thing is hold on that police officer for a couple of uh, one or two hours, then uh, complete your records and hand over the zero copy of the case papers. So this is also uh, can be taken care. So most important is the PAE. Okay, and many times, uh, many times you in hurriedly we go that even ESA guidelines, uh, ESA uh, one two, we go that receive the patient we are on the way and we start inducing the patient. So this is not at all the case nowadays. The PA, irrespective of whether it's elective or MRH, it has to be done. Okay, ESA uh, uh, grade two one, grade one, grade two, whatever it is. So definitely it uh, defends you when the case is filed against you. One thing I'm, I like to add in here is that there are two different scenarios. One, this unfortunate event occurring in a teaching institute, medical colleges. There, you definitely have a support staff. There are consultants uh, on the adjoining operation theaters. There are senior residents, junior residents. There, we have to ensure that if possible, as Dr. Arun also highlighted, that nothing wrong is said by the sweepers, bearers, you just don't know anything. There should be no loose talk. And the persons who are called for help, the seniors, they should never question the technique of anesthesia which was done. Why did you get this case done? Why did you do like this? No. At that time, you are under tremendous stress. 
the colleague, your colleague is under tremendous stress. Ask him, just go have a glass of water, have a cup of tea or coffee with lots of sugar and come back. In the meantime, manage the case sympathetically for the patient also, for the relatives also, and for the doctors also. You definitely, once there is a support system, somebody should always, if possible, if you feel appropriate, call the patient's attendant inside when the resuscitation is going on so that they also understand that yes, proper efforts are being made. Majority of the times in medical college, I must say, patient attendants should be given this much confidence. Yes, the things were done properly. It is our bad luck that this unfortunate event has occurred. You should not be smoking while telling the, uh, breaking the bad news. You should not smoke before telling that. There are, see, or you're talking on your mobile phone and breaking the bad news. No, very rightly said by Dr. Arun Sharma that be in a uh, somber place. There should be expressions of empathy, sympathy on your face. You should not be chewing chingam or masala and uh, uh, all those things and express lots of concerns so that the message goes out loud and clear that it, it has been done properly. The complication was managed properly, but unfortunate event occurred. That is one thing. We, yeah, we, we should be the part of the bereaved family. Many times what happens is uh, uh, we do take the opinion of the physicians, the cardiologists. Even if they say, yes, you can go ahead, but you have to be very, very diplomatic. If you think that you cannot be managed, yes, just defer it or you say that we will not be able to manage it. So there may be some pressures from the surgeon stating that you have taken the um, like opinion or whatever it is. So better to deny all those things, I think, sir. And secondly, the surgeons also, they should all, we should, if it is a surgical cause also, then yeah. also we have to uh, support the team. And if it is an anesthesia cause, then the surgeon should also not give the loose statements that I have done my thing. It happened because of anesthesia or vice versa, that yeah. our anesthesia yeah. technique was good, but yeah. uh, for the surgical competition, we should act like a team. But that is yeah. natural. Yeah. The exactly opposite scenario is in nursing homes. Where the role of association and its office bearers come to play, both IMA and ISA. Because in nursing home, you are alone with maximum one technician with you. And as rightly said, I was reading the chat, majority of places may not have an ICU also. We have to shift the patient for declaring it. Because you just need to buy some time. There, you always tend to call a second anesthesia, anesthesia colleague who can help you in clinical management also who can help you guide in completing the notes also, because we also know practically PAC notes are at times not written. You may be in a very hurry to get the case done, that, but ensure that once before handing over the documents to the any administrative authority, it may be numbered fine, but please complete it to the best of your knowledge and just sit in silence in some particular room and complete them. And because that is your best chance Patient is not alive, your notes will speak. Patient is not going to speak, your notes will speak. One. Two, same crowd management and that management, definitely IMA is strong, but involve your ISA fraternity also. And those officials who go there, they should also please never ask, why did you follow this technique or why did you get this case done? The unfortunate event has happened. Support your colleague and try to we manage the crowd also, try to manage the politicians also, and try to manage the police officers also. So, yes, it is a teamwork to overcome these medical legal challenges. And as Dr. Arun Sharma has very rightly said, Supreme Court has given a directive, very clear cut. Simply, doctors cannot be arrested. But the very common police officer says, Doctor, please come to the police station. That will pacify the crowd. And to crowd, they will say the doctor has been arrested. And though they won't be showing, they cannot show before uh, uh, it is very clear that until there is a medical board which shows that there is a gross criminal negligence comprising of a board of an anesthesiologist, a surgeon and a physician, depending upon case to case scenarios, arrest of doctors cannot be done. All the superintendents of police, they know about their limitations as per the court of the law. But going to police station itself is very harassing for the class one officers, whether it is an anesthesiologist or whether it is a physician or a surgeon, because that kills from inside. Anesthesiologists are noble souls. They cannot expect and cannot believe that an, an death related to anesthesia technique has happened. 
it is very difficult for them to accept that and secondly then the challenges of registration completion in the notes facing your own colleagues facing the surgical colleagues facing the public patient the patient relatives and, and and yeah. you have to have uh, grit you have to have nerves of steel remember your god whatever only thing you should remember that you it was an mishap which has occurred it is not something which you have done wrong so that is the thing teamwork teamwork should be there in such scenarios monica we can take a more questions in between thank you sir Uh, oh, Dr. Navin, can I uh, say something? We welcome Dr. Mahesh Sina, and he is also uh, expert in medical legal fields. Over to you, Dr. Mahesh Sina, please. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, about what uh, Dr. Sharma said, the actually the decisions of the Supreme Court and actual working, as you said, police works in a totally different manner. So we should not create resistance. Yeah. Actually, that that is also he has pointed out. There is no point. and to decision to doing pm we should left on the police we should not take our try to say you sign this thing that we don't want post mortem from the relative that doesn't holds any value if the relative because if anything has happened we should inform first police and take help from yeah thank you yeah, i agree with dr sina uh, post mortem there is a misconception will go against you at times it saves you also So most of the times it will it will save for us. We must inform the police rather than the relatives going and informing the police. Yeah. And whenever you are briefing to the relatives, so definitely we should uh, surgeon as well as nurses should together talk to the relatives. There shouldn't be any shifting of the responsibilities. So they have to have a five or uh, ten minutes meeting together, nurses, surgeon. Then you try to address to the relatives, including the media also. Yeah. The federal WHO trial arises soon after the some mishap happened at the table at the hospital. So immediately, within no time, media people start uh, uh, coming to the hospital. That time, surgeon as well as anesthetist uh, uh, should take a role and uh, start briefing to the our uh, media. Other thing is loose, loose talk should be avoided. See, in yeah. one of the cases in uh, Bangalore, in the reputed hospital, the residents while going the lift, they were telling about the case. He, the surgeon, bugged the case and all. The relative of the patient was there in the same lift. He came to know everything about the case. What happened in the OT? Why it happened? It's in Bangalore, on the reputed hospital. So they they lost the case because they knew that that person knew everything what happened. These two PGs talked about that case when they were going in the lift, and the other man was the this thing. So should tell that no nobody should talk about the case outside whether it is their complication or whatever it is. There's always because the other man you will not know that he may be his relative. That also question in the chat box that expert in the medical board are ready to pull your legs no it is usually not like that at the end of the day they are also the medical experts and if you tell them the truth and there is a documentation for that see yeah. experts will there is a standard language on the basis of records available they cannot have their own opinion on the basis of records available there appears to be no gross medical negligence or relatively standard level of care was was offered to the patient yeah and uh, there are some good experts also a death occurs on the table because of fat embolism they will say yeah this is a known complication of a long bone fracture multiple long bone fractures so these things yes experts but you have to convince them with two things only that whatever have, has happened Was immediately managed. We were in the OT monitoring the patient, and immediately the complication was detected and managed. Secondly, managed in with the reasonable level of care. Then no expert will usually should not go against you. But in the recent case, you may be knowing that in Kerala, where gynecologist was sentenced, the gynec expert gave opinion against another gynecologist it was a death of a fetus she was delayed in coming and all she told she should have come because there is also there we can't tell that because she told she has delayed and night she should have come and done a cesarean she did in the morning and all this she gave the opinion and it was awarded uh, uh, punishment for the doctor there is a reason in a government hospital in ernakulam is the other gynecologist because people are also there because she had some uh, what they say is they had some among them they had some uh, and most and that used this opportunity for that that also is there we can't believe everybody because that was easily they could have avoided it but did that on the basis of that the doctor was punished 
but at the end of the day i think everybody will agree that we should be present in the ot uh, till the patient is there in the ot yeah because until unless that is happening because and we understand true. the pressure of work going from one nursing home to the another nursing home and uh, we have to just balance it out why to stress our coronaries uh, later on dr arun i uh, wanted to make a point and sure um since i've uh, read some aspects of law also so i always talk to my colleagues that lawyers have very good ethics they never talk against each other they may fight in the court room but they will always sit back and have a good amount of tea uh, a decision in the high court may be challenged in a supreme court but they would never say bad words about the previous decisions we as a medical professionals always have an have a habit of uh, saying wrong about our colleagues this has to change i do yeah. tell my residents that the death in the ot usually in the current situation in the modern day anesthesia practice happens for two reasons one there was some blunder or there was some kind of an idiosyncratic reaction which was unavoidable most most patients would be successfully resuscitated in the ot so one has to and and and, and mitigation usually happen for two reasons and the cases usually goes against the doctors for two reasons one is bad communication and bad documentation If you're good at these two things, there is a good enough possibility that the cases would be decided in your favor. We were talking about consents. I would say uh, we are always expected to take a consent of a witness. I would not agree more that the best witness is the relative of the patient. There's no doubt about. It. Thank you. I want to add something. Hello. Please go ahead, sir. Please go ahead. Ah yes, uh, this uh, presence of anesthesiologists. Uh, many places we find that anesthetists are attending more than one case at a time. Some people are attending one; they give a spinal, another theater. They go and they start doing general anesthesia. So these things are just not acceptable at all. And if it it can be proved in the court that anesthetist was attending two cases or he was not there with the patient at any point of time during anesthesia the case is lost another thing is i find that documentation that we make the vital parameters of the patient so people are recording at their whims and fancies some people are recording every people are attending it our isa guidelines and wfs guidelines are every 5 minutes because there was one case where there was no record for 20 minutes and the judge said that i presume that during these 20 minutes anesthetist was not there with the patient and he was held guilty so we must make it and the vital orders every 5 minutes frequency that is not done many places thank you and i like to add on here that we should have context in uh, judiciary also with lawyers also and uh, with the police also and we should not be afraid of going to the police stations also because uh, it is not a temple where we go regularly but at times when you have to go as an association office bearer it's always better to have your uh, if your office bearer uh, your visiting card with your uh, emblem and designation written below that so it is always always better for that and and secondly there are two aspects as dr arun sharma was talking civil liability and criminal liability we have to safeguard against us by the criminal liability and also in civil liability but civil yeah. liability is compensation so it is always always better to have liability insurance also so that gives you a back of mind okay financially my uh, thing will be taken care by the indemnity insurance scheme and they will also provide us the finances to cover the legal expenses also so in this world where we are living i think whether you are in a medical setup or in a private setup you should have uh, as it is mandatory when we are in medical setup we have private in health insurance also so same way uh, even if you are in a government hospital or in a private hospital it is always will better to have a uh, professional indemnity from wherever you want whichever policy that is besides the point but that gives you insurance is a safe thing dr monica any more questions in the chat box yeah Dr. Deepak wants to ask Dr. Arun, uh, what should be done when death on table happens in a setup where there is no ICU? I mean, how to proceed about that? Where the patient should be declared in that scenario? Do I assume that this this setup 
not have a post operative area also what should i assume so i think if the if the setup has a post operative area at least shift the patient from the ot to the post operative area as dr navin said you can actually show them the resuscitation attempts tell them give them updates and that would be the most important uh, way we can handle things if the post operative area is not there then in that case uh, we can take the relatives to the ot i hope dr deepak got the answer next question is by dr chaya if death occurs after shifting to icu within a few hours uh, of surgery i guess after shifting then who will who is responsible i think you have covered this in your talk also just to reiterate again death within 24 hours is an unnatural death and uh, who is responsible is probably difficult to ascertain it is the, it will be the complaints which will be put up by the aggrieved family and then the things will be tried i think dr thaya shrivanshi is online also she can interact directly also madam please go ahead be much better sure thank you actually we are better that uh, because in a uh, western country they uh, take any complication up to 30 days into account for particularly uh, <laughs> replacement surgeries and all that although not related to anesthesia but surgical procedures they may relate it hello good evening sir good evening good evening madam please go ahead hello yeah, please go ahead please go ahead madam yes sir but uh, if the yes but the sir the cause is if not the anesthesia cause but if the cause is surgical after shifting the patient in icu after few hours suppose bleeding or uh, any problem from the icu side or from surgical side then still he will be responsible for the no i think the most important thing that we talked about was that we all to work as a team in the scenario that an adverse event has happened so if even if the death occurs in the icu it is a culmination of events which has happened few hours ago and one would need to understand that this patient would be would have been managed by the same anesthesia team as the follow up team who a similar team would be working in the ot and in the in the post operative icu so we cannot run away from the responsibility in trying to pass on the blame we need to manage the patient we need to keep our documentation right we need to communicate with the family i did have a question once where uh, there was an orthopedician who said that uh, once the patient is shifted from the ot to the icu with some complication then he would not sign on the death certificate because the death has happened in the icu i think that is something which this, these these things need to be discouraged and i can relate or connect with this more because i work in the icu and we all need to understand that the the uh, the blame would not be passed on to one single person it will be passed on to the team so we all need to work together in 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 whatever we do with the patient uh thank you thank you sir can i interrupt sure yes please hello yeah hello sir many time after when the patient is intubated but uh, means uh, i will uh, just uh, tell you one thing that happened that, uh, the pediatric patient we have given the over properly but still in the midnight because of the endotracheal tube and which uh, was not uh, immediately so then uh, We cannot uh, tell us also the is it still on pediatric ICU? Doctor Chaya, you are not audible. Can you please type your uh, question in the chat box? Look after the pediatric. Your voice is breaking, Doctor Chaya. Okay, okay, okay. I will type. Yeah, I'll take up your question. Yes. Uh, I would like, like to mention one case. The Supreme Court has given a decision that uh, a nursing home should not case a uh, case which we cannot handle. Uh, like they said, if they didn't have the ICU, why you have taken the serious patient or higher risk patient in the? So this should be also taken care by the 
uh, particularly practicing in the private sector in the nursing homes. You no, sir, yeah, it was true also, but the recent judgment has come. Yeah, recently there is a judgment also. So it is not mandatory to have an ICU unless you anticipate some complications. And also, if the machines in the ICU are also not working, so it cannot be taken as a negligence and deficiency on the part of the surgeons. So it all depends how exactly the judiciary interprets it. When in Karnataka, they said that you should not operate or you should not have a, a operate theater without there is an ICO, but the subsequent judgment has changed it. So it all depends how exactly the judiciary interprets it. Okay, sir. So Dr. Abhay wants to ask Dr. Arun, uh, how much time we uh, is allowed to hand over the papers, like to complete the paperwork and then hand it over to the board? It is updated uh, as early as possible properly. Uh, there is no fixed stability. Yeah, there are no, hard, there are no hard and fast rules. They say that in a reasonable time, right? You can buy your time, you can take road time, complete it, then you can hand over it. Uh, as far as I uh, I know, uh, there, there are recent NMC guidelines and as per those guidelines, if it's an MLC case for some reason, the, the relatives demand the, the patient doctor, you need to give it as early as possible within 24 hours. It has to be given. Yeah. Yeah, but, so, so, yeah, I mean. Buy time and immediately complete them. Don't procrastinate it. I'll yeah, put yeah. It tomorrow or I'll put tomorrow morning or like that. Finish the documentation as early as possible. Consult your seniors and teachers what exactly has to be written or uh, what exactly has to be mentioned and by taking them into confidence because your teachers may be in or your seniors, your friends may be in the last frame of mind and they definitely may tell you that, okay, these things, please do not forget to mention these things in your notes. Uh, in case of uh, this, uh, any death on the table or uh, like similar situation and police arises, uh, they will not wait for a long time. They will seize everything, all the things like, like drugs, samples, and documents. You may require them to uh, complete the writing. They may give, depending upon how is uh, the police officer, maybe give the, you one hour. But they will not say that you give me after 24 hours. Yes, yes absolutely right. Nobody, no, no police officer will wait. So what is important, yeah. there, will right. always be, there will always be some time between you declare the death versus the situation gets escalated. I think it is those that time would be a very, very vital time where the entire team needs to sit together and write down the and think about what notes need to be written. And one should not be wasting time in, as Dr. Naveen said, one should not waste that time in trying to blame your colleague. The important time should be utilized in trying to get things into order because this is the time which we will get to actually document. And once the papers are handed over to the police, then there's no turning back. Thank you, sir. should minimize smart electronic gadgets in the uh, mobile gadgets and all in the open theater as much as possible. Uh, it may not be in India, but probably slowly creep that. In one of the in one, in one of the medical cases, there was a mishap on the table. And the uh, defended defendant in fact that said, traced back with the CC camera, which was there in the operator, they came to that. When the catastrophe occurred, or the mishap occurred, Anastasia was staring at the mobile. He was using a uh, sent uh, WhatsApp and uh, Facebook and other things. So automatically the court said that. I think, sir, we had lost the network at point. When you were staring at the mobile. Well, it means that you are not staring at the uh, monitors, so there was a negligence of the parents with the smartphone. Yeah, so the best thing is always you have to be vigilant while using the uh, gadgets in the open data. Monica, next question, please. Dr. Deepak wants to ask uh, as a freshly passed out, out anesthetist. What all backup uh, should uh, he has to have, like uh, indemnity insurance and what are the other options which he should have as a practicing anesthesiologist? Dr. Naveen, you will help me with this answer. <laughs> See, <laughs> as, as, as a freshly passed out anesthesiologist, 
uh, it is always always better that your sound in your clinical as well as documentation skills if you are into private practice do follow the guidelines of isa private practitioners forum which are there on the isa website of record keeping and documentation as is important is remuneration you should uh, more equally important is your own safety so follow good clinical practice and have uh, a professional indemnity also yeah professional indemnity nowadays worth anything less than 1 cr is uh, i think i can say peanuts so have yeah. a professional indemnity worth at least 1 cr in current scenarios and which usually cost somewhere around 9000 rupees per year uh, it's nothing if we but i personally see my innova insurance is costing me 45 to 50000 rupees per year so why not uh, my professional indemnity that i'm getting in 10000 rupees for 1 cr so always always uh, have that solid thing in mind mind read something about legal things also some uh, some legal things also be sound in your legal knowledge also attend the classes and webinars like this where law gives you some sort of protection it's not that all judges i belong to a legal family my father is a lawyer the judges and lawyers also have respect for doctors the only thing is that we have to maintain that respect and know our rights and duties also so as the karun said please do not complain about each other in social media and in public support each other do not do not think that I, we are the best doctor and others are foolish so please support your anesthesia colleagues if something happens adverse thing happens and this can happen to anybody anywhere in the world so this is that, that was one misfortune day for that particular anesthesia support your colleague support your colleague Say that this thing never happens to anybody. All our patients are safe, and we are we administer safe, good quality anesthesia to everyone. That is the motto of our Platinum Jubilee year also. Navin. Yes. Uh, one one doubt. Yes, sir. Indemnity insurance. You are totally working in the government sector. That is it. Do they cover you fully, or do you also require indemnity? How much they cover? Because I say you are working for the government, you are paid by the government, whatever it is, or you need that also. See, at the end of the day, I personally am working in the government sector, and I have taken professional indemnity insurance scheme. One, two, in government sector also, if some case is filed against a particular doctor, the medical superintendent will mark it to the head of the department. Head of the department yeah. will mark it to the that particular doctor. At the end of the day, you have to defend yourself. The medical college or the teaching hospital give will give you a legal aid, legal remembrance, or a legal advisor. But they, you want to have a lawyer on which you yeah. have, right? So that is the best thing about professional indemnity that you can have lawyer of your own choice, and that fees correct indemnity. That fees that lawyer fees will be even, even if there is. A Even so, if there is some sort of out of court settlement, even so, if there is out of court settlement, they do take care of it. So, 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 I, I'll come to that out of court. So that is why it is equally important to take professional indemnity. Ninety-five percent of the cases are out of court settlements only, and it is rightly said, if you can buy peace, buy it. But don't yeah. be hurry in buying peace. When the tempers are high, just manage the things properly. Correct. Manage at multiple levels. I'm telling you, this, this is a mind game. You have to manage it clinically also, academically also. Your friends also, OT staff also, surgeon also, relatives also, politicians also, police officials also, judiciary also, CMO also, IMA also. You have to show that I have done my best for the patient. This adverse event has occurred. Occurred. I have to manage that also. Simple thing. So yes, it is a nightmare, but have faith on God. This too shall pass away. This too shall pass away. These bad days shall pass away. And if you are right, if your intent was right, you will be exonerated, and all the forces in this world will work in your favor that you are exonerated from a thing which you have never done anything wrong about. Back to Monica. Thank you, sir. So I'll uh, complete the question asked by Dr. Chaya. Uh, so she is talking about one pediatric patient shifted to a pediatric ICU. With endotracheal tube. After a few hours, the tube got blocked and not noticed by pediatric doctor, and uh, the patient was lost. What should be done in that case? Uh, 
Dr. Arun? Uh, it's a, it's a, again, these questions are, I think, very difficult to answer in a sense that uh, somebody, the pediatrics team would probably talk to the family. It's ultimately, at the end of the day, family who would decide whom the wish to put the blame on. And if we start dividing the blame, the term which is called as medical jousting, then we all would be in trouble. I think manage the scenario, communicate the scenario to the family, and hope that the family decide with your experience. I guess, first of all, uh, the pediatric doctors and yourself should uh, talk to each other. And as a team, how you have to act, you should formulate that and then uh, right. go so, for... It will be never be documented that the tube was blocked or was dislodged. Yes. Okay. The so take-home message is that one... Yeah, yeah, it should never be. Yeah. <laughs> And another question is coming once you are in immunity to ISA, it is ISA endorsed. ISA is a clinical academic research body which does yeah. not sell uh, insurance, it only endorses it. If your policy is good, which you are continuing, continue with that policy and tell the good points about your policy. We will incorporate in our policy. If this is better, take it simple. We are an only endorsing body. So, in case of uh, death in on OT table. Who will sign the death certificate, the surgeon or the anesthetist? In fact, I would wish to ask a question related to this question. And this is something which I even do not have an answer. We did talk about the fact that uh, we are expected to sign a death certificate. So this is an unnatural death. So how would you decide yeah. the cause of death, actually? I have this question to the experts. Because signing the death certificate is something different. What is the cause of death? How would you say that? And the problem is, let's say I write the cause of death as cardiac arrest, or which is not recommended. I write it as uh, acute coronary syndrome, let's say. And the case goes to an autopsy. The family says, I autopsy karani hai. And the cause of death is assumed to be something different. Then what would we do? Then it's a, it's a clear case of, then this becomes a clear case of negligence. So can we have some feedback on what, how would you decide the cause of death in these situations? If the patient goes for the autopsy, you need not issue any death certificate. Right. Then the certificate will be issued after postmortem. Yes, yes. But the problem is that a situation where the patient, see, most often we, we did talk about the fact that most often we declare the patient in the ICU and the body is handed over to the family. In about, I think, seven out of 10 cases, unless until, until the family creates a problem, your body would be handed over the family without a post-mortem examination. And in that case, when the body is being handed, it is also sure that the medical team would have written something as a cause of death. So uh, the challenge... a for, for Actually, death in IC and death in OT, uh, I think it's a slightly different thing. Uh, in OT, it is a sort of acute situation, while most of the cases in ICU, it is a sustained chronic situation. Patient may be for many days there. There may be a lot of interaction between the family and other. And there's a format, a standard format of giving the cause of death certificate. Actually, what we say death certificate is a cause of death in particular format. Like you said, we don't write now cardiac pulmonary arrest and not that. A, B, and C, what is the primary cause, secondary, and tertiary cause. So there then you put on like that. What is the primary cause and what is the underlying cause? They have two columns, immediate cause and all. You write cardiac respiratory arrest. Other than pending uh, postmortem report or chemical analysis, we write that. When we give that in the government sector, we write that cardiac respiratory arrest was existing. Second then column, we leave blank or write there pending PM report or chemical analysis report. Even That's what you done. Do like that. No, no, cardiac no. respiratory arrest, I think it should not be written. Now, now it is. Nowadays, it, it, it is read that. It, it, it has changed. Not uh, only recently, it has been that. That is why I say a mode of death. It's a mode of death. The second <laughs> column, you write pending analysis or pending this report, investigation report. That is the thing because when they want immediately, sometimes they want that for taking the body or uh, this thing. They want that when they are taking the body. Do like there are even the PM also report. We do not write that because. Uh, I read that uh, a final opinion pending chemical analysis report or this thing. That is what we write. Thank you, sir. So I think uh, this uh, will be our last question. Can we shift the patient to ICU from OT and then declare the death? 
Yes. Which we have actually been and it may not be the right way, but then this is something which is... But then, it depends on where you do, how you do, and all see your situation. It's all depends on the situation. More than that, the theoretical telling, see, what is there in that situation, best we have to do that. See, how is that? Because see, the, what we talk theory and these things, because when that situation, what we can do, who are there, how you can do that. That's our judgment there. See, you have nobody else there. You are alone and you are not. You may have to buy some time sometimes. Sometimes you want to buy time. Yes, you have to uh, take the issue there also. If you don't, people, okay, we'll do. Uh, as uh, sir told in the beginning only that uh, in US also, they take to the issue. See, that situation how you buy time. Sometimes you want to buy because the mob will come and all. You tell suddenly. So whether you can do in the theater only or in a single theater, another case is waiting. What would you do that? This depends on how you do. In that particular situation, we have to analyze and then we can do that because everything we can tell strictly like this. because it's theoretical yes you have to declare that only there is the right thing i'm doing everything is right means so if you do everything right people may not take that in the good sense we have to think that situationally we have to analyze and do that thank you sir see, there may be questions coming up day in and day out for that we have got a dedicated isa legal cell also where all majority of these experts are there in that particular whatsapp group those who are interested in joining uh, ISA legal cell, those who got sound bit knowledge of law, please join that group and give your expert opinion or help the members. See, and I won't talk about the members, but Dr. Giri will agree to me. We have been there helping our colleagues in all parts of the of, of, of India, whether it is the central India or the southern India or the northern India, when they come up with medical legal uh, cases. Recently, we had one, I can say in the vividly remember, in last six months or so, more than 10 cases have come to us as ISN National. And we also gave our uh, members repose faith in us. They send their papers, documentation. We go through them. Uh, the legal panel also studies that and gives assistance to them also, both in two fields. One is in the clinical aspect. And secondly, they, they get uh, reassured also. So those who are interested in joining, uh, I was reading something in chat box. They can personally contact me on my number or the office number. Uh, we will add you in that particular group. 9091-515151. I repeat 9091-515151. I am repeating it 9091-515151. 9091-515151. And we are there as a body, at the national body also. We, have, we support whether it is... Uh, there have been instances of sudden arrest by the police uh, or the doctors. We support our doctors or the termination of their licenses or any other things which come out in, in their way. So the only thing is that we try to help our members, no fault finding. This particular mishap has occurred. It should not have occur, occur in future with anyone. With this intention only, uh, we had this particular class. And I'm really thankful to Dr. Arun Sharma for uh, coming up with an emotional and uh, uh, fact-based uh, presentation. We have been discussing this since this very long and we have been, we wanted to have a physical one. COVID came and then uh, the virtual things became the things. So thank you, Arun. I repeat, Arun is my both MBBS and MD classmate and he has got interest in uh, legal matters. And we look forward to more interaction on this subject matter with you uh, in near future also. Thank you, Dr. Arun. And, uh, Next Monday, uh, before our national conference starts, we'll be having another uh, interesting session from a new a part of the world, uh, which we will be uh, exploring for the first time, a class from Leh, Ladakh, the newly created Union Territory. So Dr. Morup will be talking about the challenges of the high altitude and, and how to do surgery there and even the laparoscopic procedures. So. Uh, please do join and motivate our friends from uh, Leh Ladakh. And next week, we'll be interacting same time, uh, Monday, 5 to 6.30. And then uh, you all are welcome to join our prestigious 69th Annual National Conference of ISA from uh, 23rd to 27th of November at Scotland of East, Shillong, Meghalaya. Thank you very yes, much. Please. Naveen, next week will be last uh, webinar of you and me as President Secretary. We right. expect more people in the last, but uh, people may be leaving, uh, starting leaving to Shillong that day. Still, uh, 